All right, take out your Bibles. Take out your uh, iPad, your phone, whatever you use during the week. Um, we're going to open to eventually Luke chapter 6 is where we'll spend most of our time. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers will bring them. Um, we're in our series called Together, and uh, it's based in Jesus' conversation in uh, John chapter 13, where he said, a new command I give you, as I've loved you, love one another. Um, by this love, people will, all the world will know that you're my disciples. And so we've been exploring not just what it means to love, but to love as Jesus loved. And it's been challenging. Um, if we're truly listening to Jesus' words about, okay, forgive, okay, welcome without uh, hesitation, uh, speak life over people. And today we're talking about loving enemies. And it, this, this is hard stuff. Um, but Jesus doesn't call us to things that we can't do with him. So just remember that. As we get challenged by his words going, okay, Lord, how on earth would this ever happen in my life, right? So I want to start with a couple stories. Um, we have some names up here, right? So we're going to start with Tim. Tim is a friend of mine. This is a real story. And he said that he um, often struggled with people came to, the, the, came to the door to try to sell stuff, whether it be solar or magazines, whatever it is. Has anyone else ever felt that way? Were you, okay, great. So at some point, right? Um, but he said he wasn't acting like, in, in so many ways, he wasn't acting like himself. Like he, that frustration was coming out in a way that he wasn't satisfied and he felt convicted. And so um, he's really mature in his relationship with Jesus. And so instead of just going, eh, he goes, okay, I feel convicted. I'm going to do something about it. And so he decided to change how he interacted with those people that were coming to the door. And so now when they come to the door, um, before they say anything, he goes, hey, before you talk, do you need anything to drink or do you need to use the restroom? And he said about 25% of the people actually go, yes. And those 25%, after they get a drink or use the restroom, they don't talk about sales anymore and they go. And that wasn't necessarily his goal, but he's like, it changed something in them. The other 75%, he goes, hey, listen, um, if you don't need the restroom or something to drink, let me tell you, I know that part of what's helpful to you is meeting with as many people as you can to increase the odds. I'm not going to say yes, so the best thing you could do is move on. And I, you're doing a great job, but I don't want to waste your time. And he said, 98% of those people go, thank you so much. I'm going to head out. The point of that story is um, he felt something, changed it, and it actually changed him is what took place, right? The other people too. Um, another story among a bunch up here. This is Elizabeth. No, nope, this is a chair. Um, her name is Elizabeth Elliot, and um, her husband um, was a missionary to the jungles of Ecuador, and so around 1957, I think, um, her husband went into the jungles, and he and five of other his partners uh, in ministry were speared to death by the tribe that lived there, the very tribe that they were trying to minister to. Again, true story. Um, so Elizabeth, after the death of her husband, for the next two years, decided to learn the language of that tribe in the jungle, and then after she learned the language well enough, she took her little girl and they went and they moved into the jungle and started ministering to them for years. And many of them became Christians after that. Um, yeah, and she's a legend. Um, a bunch of, I'm going to tell you each of something that goes with each of these chairs through the message. And I want us to consider what do they have in common? Um, it has everything to do with what we're talking about today in Jesus' words in Luke. So we'll get back and we'll tell stories from each of those chairs um, and we'll talk at the end, what, who's sitting here and what are they listening to? Uh, Luke 6, let's do it. I'm going to come down to you because we have to go participation because this is heavy stuff and we need to talk. Um, all right, let's read. Luke 6, 27. But to you, you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. So um, let's name who are some of our enemies. <laughs> Traffic, maybe. Let's get, yes, yes, abs actually, that is a yes and amen. Let's, uh, people-wise, who are our enemies? <laughs> yeah, that's an Angels fan. Uh, any, 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 any answers? Who are our enemies? Bosses. Bosses, are they your enemy? They can be. They can be. Okay, anybody else? What's that? If they hate you, yep, that could be your enemy. Anyone else? Extremists. On which side, Jen? <laughs> uh, anyone else? You guys have way more answers in the first service. They just sat there. Family members can be enemies. Uh, no one said terrorists, but you just did, so terrorists. Um, anyone else? Politicians are enemies. Okay. What was that? 
people who are harsh. Yeah. Okay, so we've got some. So here's Jesus said uh, to love them. So good luck, you guys. Um, so for real, um, everyone you just mentioned, his, he wasn't kidding like I am. He's like, oh, okay, that, that per- your boss, um, a, a terrorist, an extremist on the other side of whatever you think, like, I'm calling you to love them. Okay, let's keep going. Do good to those who hate you. Uh, what does it mean to do good? Practically, if you were, okay, if you know someone in your life who you feel like, okay, I think they hate me, and you're like, okay, I might consider doing good, what does that mean? What are you supposed to do? How do you do good? Unconditional love, but how? What can I, what, what are my actions? Listen. What was that? Keep the conversation going. Prefer them over yourself. And that's part of our series, right? Help them. Elevate them. Pray for them, right? And that gets to our next one. Um, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. So remember, the beginning of this, Jesus is saying loving enemies the culture he was speaking into, especially if you were Jewish. Now, Luke has an audience that's, that he's, spe- he's bending it towards the Gentiles, but in Matthew, Jesus, same words in a different time or a different place towards the Jewish audience. Remember who they're, they would have, if we asked them, who's your enemy, what would they have, most of them have said? Rome. And here's, if you're new to church, here's what we mean. Forever, Israel was called to be the light of the world. So in their idea and their theocracy that they, they lived under, God was the ruler of everything. It was, okay, he's called us to help reflect him to the rest of the world. So the order of things is God, then us, then everybody else. Not like hierarchical as far as better than, but he's called us to be a light. Rome comes in and they're under Roman occupation and not every Roman soldier was brutal, but many of them were. But the main thing was Rome was in the way of them doing their job to the rest of the world as far as they were concerned. Something the Messiah was going to do was get rid of Rome so they could get back to business. So when Jesus says, I want you to love your enemies, they're like, what? But we're supposed to get them out of, the, like, you're supposed to get them out of the way. What do you mean love them? But then the rest of these, they could fall into the category of enemies, but he just simply says, pray for those who mistreat you. So for those of us that can't name an enemy, no problem. Have you ever been mistreated? If you've been mistreated, would you raise your hand nice and high? Um, Let's pray for that person right now. Who comes to mind when you think of somebody who's mistreated you, historically or now? Let's pray, for real. Let's bow our heads, let's pray. Um, And my encouragement is this. Um, I, maybe not you, I am tempted to go, Lord, change their heart. (laughs) Lord, uh, Help them to come to me and ask for free, all those things. Um, But in the context of blessing and doing good, um, I'll pray. I have someone that comes to mind, and uh, here's how I feel compelled to pray. So, Lord, I pray for this person. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray for blessing over their life. I pray for good to happen to them today. I pray for your presence and your influence in their life to bring them joy and peace I pray they'd have an amazing Christmas season. And so just take a second and whatever you feel left to pray, go for it. Amen. Um, was that hard? Was that difficult for anybody? Just Roger. Sorry, buddy. And Hannah. Okay, yeah, I know it was, it could have been difficult for some of us. If it is, that's okay. And if you're like, I don't want to do that. That's okay. Really. It just gives us a sense of going, oh my gosh, this is a real, (laughs) the point of praying is like, let's just do this. Let's do what he called us to do. Um, Also, as we talk about loving enemies, um, I want it to be really clear. There are categories of evil that have happened in the world that would cause you to, it would not be healthy or safe for you to be in proximity to that person to do some of the things we're talking about. If you're like, I don't know, this is just like, it was an abuse situation or it is an abuse situation. There are parameters around Jesus' words that we can help with pastorally that, so just just know that as we go along. Um, It might not be safe in some of these situations. Okay, next, it gets easier. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other one also. Um, Think about that image. Um, 
and the principle of that. So we can get into the minutiae and go, okay, what if someone comes to my house and they're hitting all my family? What? He, he's, he's talking about a culture of complete dishonor, of disdain, of things like that. And, and yes, he meant this, but think about what he's saying. I don't want you to retaliate in this kind of situation. I don't want you to retaliate. I honestly don't think that at times, most of the time, I feel strong enough to do that. This is actually the position of strength, which is so weird in our culture. It's like, hit back and get him and stuff. It takes way more strength, way more confidence in Jesus to, to, to in love, go, nope. I mean, I, it just feels foreign to me at times. I don't know about for you guys. I, as I prepared for this message, I want you to know, like, reading Jesus' words, I've read this, heard it, taught it so many times, and there's something about his word is living and active. You come back to it, and it keeps reading you. It keeps reading you. And I read it this week, and I'm like, there was two things that came up. One is I go, oh my gosh, like this is truly the center of Jesus' teaching. Like this is the center. If you ever wonder, like, let me, let me get in touch with Jesus. Recently, I've just been listening to the Sermon on the Mount. Just do it. Matthew 5 through 7, just listen to the Sermon on the Mount and go, oh my gosh, this is the core of everything he's saying. I know it's important, but some, somehow it just kind of came up different going, man, this is it. This is everything. And at the same time, I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel so far from this sometimes. He's had victory. I'm super stoked about that. But there's times where I go, I feel really far from this. Like he really meant, like he actually <laughs> meant this. And I'm, it's not a metaphor. It's not like, hey, just be cool to be like, wow, what strength this takes. How close I must have to get to him. Um, and my prayer has been that as a church, we would kind of go like this today. As a group, we would, we would move. I don't know if we can get here, but we can take a step, right? And part of that is our choice. Um, how are you guys doing? So for real, so first service felt like this, and I want to know what this is. It feels like, <sighs> what are you thinking right now? For real. What do you got? Jason. Yeah. Yeah. So online, Jason was saying like, if, if there's an immediacy, if somebody recently wronged you, it, that there, it takes some processing in the moment, right? Uh, anyone else? What are, you, what are you thinking right now? What's going on? Heavy. Feels heavy. Why? Well, because when, when uh, you... Uh, why, are you why are you smiling at me right now? <laughs> she can't even... She's like, I, it's the handsomeness. <laughs> Message received. She's my wife, by the way, in case you're new. <laughs> you're like, what's going on right now? No, and then you just kind of, it's like you're wanting us to reflect on it. Yeah. And then you start to kind of have some feelings. And so, and thought, yep. yeah, yep, yep, yep. Anyone right. else feel like that? Jay, and online, Jen said it feels a little bit heavy. Like, I'm, I'm starting to think about this, and there's people, and there's relationship, there's emotions. Anyone else feeling heavy at all? Okay. Jamie. Um, Yes. Okay, this is really important. So Jamie said, it feels really important culturally right now to take a stand for what you believe in. Hear this. The way that Jesus is calling us to take a stand is different than what you hear on the news and social media and maybe with friends. This is the way he's telling us to take a stand. Yeah, and it's so countercultural. It's so difficult. And it feels like a position of weakness. But it is the only thing that will change this planet. It's the only thing that ever did. If he came and he gave us all these strong words and go, you guys go and fight and do this. That's, take his lead. How he changed the world is by laying his life down. And he didn't argue about politics. He didn't argue until he was mad at the church people. It's not that we can't have an opinion. It's not that we shouldn't vote. Of course not. We, we do those things here. But they get elevated so much. In this, in this um, Brian's having a talk after, seconds, after this service today. It's one of our together talks to help us be equipped to do what we're talking about. But as Jamie said, so he told me about a, a survey this, uh, this week that he saw 
one out of four Americans across the political spectrum, so Americans in general, agreed that violence was an appropriate way to respond to their candidate not being elected. So you may, th if, I just want you to know, if you're in the room and you're like, absolutely, you are most welcome here. Let's talk. And I'm not going to try to convince you, but what I do want to put forth in the room is I believe Jesus is teaching something very different than that. Very different. We can argue, we can, like, okay. Um, he chose a different way. And it's not a position of weakness. Um, it is very easy for us to get swept up in culture and go, yes, absolutely, let's go. Um, with your boss, with your friend, with your family members. And there's a different way that actually leads to peace in life. And until you step into it, it just feels really foreign and it feels really difficult. Um, so we're in this together. And I'm so glad you guys share that stuff because that, that's the deal. It's really, really hard to do this stuff. Spend more time with Jesus words than you do with the influence words in your life. Um, I literally just, I can't imagine someone listening to the Sermon on the Mount and coming up with a different conclusion. I, I can't fathom it. Literally, of, yes, let's go and kick their butts after you read the sermon. You can't do it. And we must not ignore the words of Christ. If you actually believe he's the Lord and Savior of the world, but we take some of his words and leave other ones aside, that is not logical and it makes no sense. Your life, as you're leading it, doesn't make sense. Now, to go, I'm going to try, but it's really hard. I mess up. That's a whole different story. But let's not ignore the way he said forward. And there is example after example after example with his disciples, with the early church, with the historical church that show this actually changes things. It really, it's the only thing it ever has. Okay. <laughs> Anna, can I have 20 more minutes? If someone slaps you on the cheek, we did that. Next, if someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Um, C.S. Lewis says, love is never wasted for its value does not rest on reciprocity. Meaning, your acts of love or prayers or kindness or blessing those who persecute you or praying for those who mistreat you. C.S. Lewis is saying that love is never wasted because what happens in return doesn't state the value of what your love was. Um, the value of how you loved doesn't depend on someone's reaction or non-reaction. And then he, um, he says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to, do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that, meaning people who don't love God. We're all sinners, so it didn't mean that. And if you lend to those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend, lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father in heaven is merciful. Um, this idea of reward, we don't do these things for a reward, but Jesus promises a reward. He goes, if you do these things, your reward will be great. It's hard to quantify what he's talking about unless you've stepped into it. And here's what I mean. Our reward is Jesus. That's the bumper sticker answer, but it's actually true. Our reward is Jesus in the future. Because as we'll see in a second, Jesus, Jesus was able to love because he left justice in the hands of the Father. And so like, I, I trust God so much that how much I want this person to be punished for what they're doing he told me he'll take care of it. <clears throat> okay. It's in his hands, not mine. Um, as we step into this, I, I, the I, I've given a couple examples over the last six months. I'll give one of the two, but they're very, very similar. Um, I don't know that, well, for sure, like some people, Christians in the world, I don't have enemies that are trying to kill me. Um, <laughs> at least I haven't found that out yet. Um, do I have people in my life who I think don't like me or don't like what I do here or don't like how I've done what it, absolutely. There's a list and I could list them out. Um, I've done this for a long time and that's just what goes on. Um, one of those folks I saw in um, Starbucks a few months back, I told the story, I'm just gonna repeat it because it has to do with what happened after. Um, 
and I hadn't seen them in about four or five years. And uh, everything in me thought like, it's not just possible, but it's likely if I say hi, they're going to turn around and go and maybe say a few choice words before they leave. And we hadn't seen each other. That didn't happen. We had a really great conversation. Um, they said, hey, tell Jen I said, hey. And I said, I'll be praying for you. Like, that's how it ended. That wasn't hard for me. I love them so much. And I still do. And I did. Um, I left with two things going, oh my gosh, I'm changing. Like, sometimes I still feel like a baby Christian. Because when his word feels so far off, I'm like, am I ever going to get there? And I was like, that wasn't as hard as I, th- like, how I'm feeling about things doesn't depend on how they reacted to me right now as much as it used to. Are you kidding me? Um, and then I received my reward of feeling really close to Jesus. That's all I can give you as it's those moments and others like our series where I welcome, I forgive, I love someone who maybe doesn't want me to, like, and I take those steps. I make a choice to step and go in the direction he's going. And I take that step and I feel like my soul and my heart scream back, this is how you were meant to live. This is how Chad is truly meant to operate. This is what it feels like. And then I actually pray so many times, like, God, please let me feel like this all the time. He's like, well, just keep doing that. <laughs> um, that's, that's our reward. It's actually Jesus. What does that mean in the future? I don't know. More than we can ask or imagine because that's what his word says. I don't know. Um, but there is something to stepping into this. And so, all right, I've got to blister through these. Just know that everything I'm saying is right and I had way more details. Here we go. Um, how does Jesus love enemies? So this, he, he told us to, but he never does anything he doesn't do himself. So he loved enemies. Say the Christian answer. How did he love us? He died for us. Yes. That's a big deal. <laughs> like, yes. And Romans tells us, so if we look at Romans chapter five, um, in verse 10, so uh, sorry, starting in verse eight, but God demonstrates. So he didn't just talk about it. He didn't just send other people to tell us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then down to verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled him to, uh, through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? So Paul very specifically is saying, hey, Without Christ, we were his enemies. So why do we love enemies? Because Jesus loved us. And that is a bumper sticker, but it's, that is our motivation because of how we've been treated by Jesus himself, especially some of us who feel like, okay, I've got a, I've got a list of things why he shouldn't have allowed me into his kingdom. He forgave me. He loved me anyway. <sighs> Paul, is, Paul is a messenger that embodies the message. Paul calls himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, I was a blasphemer and I was the worst of sinners. And yet Jesus, as I was against him, died for me anyway. And his death wasn't warranted on my response at all. Okay, Jesus, I'll try because of what you've done. So he's done this. While they're crucifying me, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's even loving, he's loving with his words and his actions the whole time. So this love, his words, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, these things were taught to his disciples and then they actually started doing it. I mean, they really did. They started living this way. And so, where is he? So Paul, we're gonna read from Romans. Um, Romans, many believe, was, it's about, it was written down in about the sixth century, about 30 years after Jesus, but when Paul was ministering. At this time, we already talked about Rome, um, but the Roman emperor, his name was Nero, and he was, by all historical accounts, he was nuts. But he was brutal to Christians. Talk about enemies. People had their family members killed and hanging up on poles used as torches, like tiki torches kind of thing. Like this is the kind of sickening stuff that he did. And yet Paul is taking Jesus' words and telling his church, this applies to us. So here's some of what he says. In that culture, Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. They would, have re- they would have gotten together in a group and read his words out loud. Think about the reaction of people who had had a loved one die. Think, I mean, the tension. We feel tension, they felt tension. And it's different ways. It's not better or worse. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. 
And this sounds a lot like his teacher. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. The teaching throughout the Old Testament was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And it was God governing his people going, okay, if you get done to you, whatever you do to somebody else, you're probably not gonna do it. But Jesus is elevating that instead of just going, okay, I don't want any killing each other. I'm taking this even further so your actions actually make a difference instead of just simmering somebody down. Radical teaching. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. This is what Jesus, like, God will take care of it. Same teaching, 30 years later. For it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Think about that. Do not be overcome by evil. Do not let your anger, your mistreatment, the unfairness that you have experienced lead your heart. And that is really hard to do. Really hard to do. And if you're there right now going, I don't even want to, I'm in your club. Totally in your club. It's hard stuff. Um, this continued um, and has continued for 2,000 years. For the first 300-something years before Emperor Constantine, Constantine came into power, um, there was just rampant persecution against the church. It had its waves, emperor to emperor, but for the first 300 years, off and on they experienced this. So that's where, where is she, Blandina. Um, this young woman, Blandina, around somewhere in the second century, um, Marcus Aurelius is the emperor, and there's persecution going on, and so she experiences this. She's a slave girl, actually, but she won't deny Christ. So the first stage of stuff that happens to her is she's tortured, and she's tortured in such ways they didn't know what else to do because she would not relent. They didn't know how else to treat her because she kept saying, I'm a Christian woman and we've done nothing wrong. That's the report that she kept saying. So then they brought her out into the arena and often you've heard these stories. These are real. These are our brothers and sisters. This is real. Uh, brought her out into arena and sick the wild animals on her because that was cheaper entertainment than gladiators and things like that. Um, after that didn't work, then they just stabbed her and they killed her. Um, she went to her death, being an example to others, including another young man um, that she spoke directly to and was trying to encourage him because they were both probably about 15 years old. She's a hero. Um, and unless we think that is just for then, um, that's where this other number comes in, this 360 million. Um, around the globe, somewhere around that right now, there are 360 million of your brothers and sisters that are in Christ who are under persecution. 360 million. In my opinion, that does include anyone in the United States in general. Um, persecution meaning you cannot, you may not, you're going to be thrown in jail all the way to we will, we're going to kill you for this. Um, we don't have anyone throwing rocks at our church trying to burn it today. That, that, that's really what we're talking about. In the, in the um, Last year, about 5,300 Christians were killed for their faith. That's about 15 every single day. So every hour and a half, and that was more than the year before. This is not to bum us out, but it's to tell us um, these words apply to them. So they certainly apply to some of the stuff that we're dealing with as well. It doesn't mean it's like some of our stuff is deep and it's emotional. We're not comparing difficulty. It's that we sit here and we, we apply this stuff together. And we have brothers and sisters that are they're doing this. They're actually doing it. And we get courage from each other. We build our faith from each other. And I need it. I really need it. I'm telling you guys. So I've had a few victories that have gone, oh, and I, I don't know about you when, you, when you feel yourself changing towards scripture, you're like, okay, this, uh, I, think, I think this Christianity thing is working. Okay, it's encouraging. And then there's moments where you go, whew. And if it's ever condemnation, that's not Jesus. But if he's like, come on, let's go. That, that might be him. That's his voice. He uses with me. I know that's weird. It sounds like a, I don't know what that sounded like. It's a coach voice. It's always a coach voice. He knows, um, it's gravelly. But this week when I was reading this, the thought came to my mind. And this, it was just fresh. It was, the, the scripture was reading me anew. It was reading me fresh. And I realized um, it's easier with me than it is with Jen or my kids. When I hear somebody mistreating them, I could list out for all of them, I don't like this person right now. 
Like, I, I, would, I, I think I've said now, I don't like them. That's not very pastoral. That's not very Christian. I'm just being honest with you. I don't think there's a time in my life of faith that I have ever gone to Jen or the kids after they said someone mistreated them and I said, let's pray. I don't think I've ever done that. But I'm going to now. Join me. I'm learning. We're learning. Like, that's how scripture read me this week. It's like, okay. It wasn't condemnation. It's like, I, you're ready for that realization. Can you handle it? I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm gonna do my best to pray when I hear that somebody did it. Uh, Madeline, my daughter, does this better than I think Jen and I put together. She's leading us as far as she's got stuff going on at school and she, like, she's amazing. Um, but I have room to grow and would you join me in just taking a step? How do we do it? Um, modern day stuff. So I think the last, um, I told my story, that's me. I told about Paul. We'll get to you in a second. Um, missionary, that we don't have a name, but in one of the commentaries I was reading this week, Kent Hughes, um, Kent Hughes' wife had a friend who was a missionary. This missionary was coming home on furlough, which means they were going to have, their family's going to have a good long break after being in the mission field for a long time, serving other people. Now remember, a missionary is a really super good Christian, right? Super Christian. They're missionaries. They're giving their whole life. We're all missionaries. That's right, all of Christ. And so they were coming home for their furlough and they had a town home that they hadn't, they'd never had their own place before. And apparently she was creative and wanted to decorate. So the patio was her decorative point. That was her place of relaxation until the neighbors move in. Neighbors moved in and whatever it means, they were chaotic. They were loud. Parties and noise, nighttime, daytime. Uh, he mentioned they were like peeing in the front yard. I don't know what that means, but that's what they said in the book. Um, and so she's praying going, Lord, and like gritted teeth kind of prayers, like, what the heck? What do I do? Like, I don't like all the stuff that we might think. Um, and then it just continues to the point where the neighbor's kids come and they spray paint her porch with orange paint, the one that she liked and decorated, on the walls, on the roof, on the floor, everything. And her prayers continue like, oh my gosh. And then somehow she was prompted one day to write down, if they were neighbors that I actually loved and liked, how would I treat them? And then she said, I just started doing that. So she started bringing him cookies. Um, she offered to babysit for free for those kids who had done that. Um, she and the mom started having coffees in relationship to the point where um, this woman's heart started softening because she realized there was pain in that family. And so she started to be able to come alongside and their relationship developed to such a point where when that family moved out, she wept. Jesus Christ is the only one who can do that. That's it. If you want that life, you've got to step in and try with him. There's no other, there's, I mean, um, also borrowed from this week, but everything he's asking us to do is unnatural. It's unnatural. So therefore, when we talk about the Holy Spirit living in us, that's why we go, this is supernatural. That's what that means, like, I'm going to have to move past my natural instincts, my fleshly instincts, my emotions. And so what he's asking us to do, Oak House, as a community, is to show together the rest of the world that something different happens when God comes to live in your heart. We do things, we are capable of things that we were not capable of before we were Christians. Otherwise, he's like, you can love like other people love you. Like, everyone does that. Now, if it's just one person, if it's just, you know, her or him or you, like people go, oh, that's just, a, they're just amazing. Like they're crazy. But if all of us take a step together, like we all move in this direction and go after this series, we're going to love differently. Yeah. Then it points to Jesus. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, Matt's amazing. Oh, look at Alex. No, wait, what happened to all of you? How could all of you be like this? We're followers of Jesus. And we are trying our best to show a world that desperately needs to see somebody act like him. We are trying. Our world must see us act like Jesus told us to act. And this is the core and it's the most difficult and it is the most glorious place we can rest. Would you pray with me today? Would you act this week and go, okay, what step can I take? This is the answer. By answer, I just mean, um, what better way to be the light to the world? What better way to fill, fulfill our vocation? Um, 
Yeah, Ben, why don't you guys come up? We'll respond. Um, so what do all these people have in common? Um, and, your sit, and this is your seat. You guys all fit here. Um, what we all have in common is that Jesus reads this sermon to all of us without qualification. From, I have a trouble with people who come up to the door and solicit, to my husband was killed in the jungle, to chat at Starbucks, like, he reads this scripture, or Jesus says these words to this group without going, but hold on, we'll, we'll take, I get your nuance, we'll figure that out later. I know yours seems unfair, we'll do that. That's all of us. So we all sit here together and under Jesus' words and go, okay, Jesus, what does that mean for me? And maybe your step today is just admitting to him, literally just have an honest conversation. Do you read the Psalms? David is like, no way, this is so unfair. God smite that entire nation. Like you can be honest with him. So if that's where you're at today and you have someone on your mind, you're like, I can't, Lord. Start there, start there. And we're gonna worship Jesus and we're gonna exalt his name. We're gonna exalt his name because he loved us first. He loved us when we were doing all the stuff and he loves us right now and he's present in the room. And we sing out in faith, you are the only way. And I choose it. So Lord, we worship you right now. You are good and your faithful love endures forever. God, that you invite us into this life. We do not, we do not deserve it. We're not worthy and yet you say that we are and so we step in. Would you be honored and would you be glorified by our words and our actions and would our songs be meaningful to you right now? In Jesus' name, amen.